Hi, I'm Carol Shaw. I'm a certified translator and licensed court interpreter. And it's my privilege to spend a few moments sharing some tips for how to keep your business afloat while serving as a caregiver. I do have some experience in this. When I began my practice, my children were young adolescents. And then I cared for my late husband before he passed. But most of the tips I want to share with you today come from the time after my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Not long after that, my mother began to show some signs of dementia. So at the request, we moved them from close to me here in Texas up to their home area of northern Indiana, where they moved into a progressive care facility about 10 minutes away from my eldest sibling. For the next few years, I traveled every year, several times a year, to live with my parents for two to six weeks at a time as live-in respite care. And that's when I found out that I really was not as prepared as I thought I had been. So I'm going to share with you a few tips in case this ever becomes your journey. Okay, when freelancer means caregiver. Our availability is different in reality and perception. The perception of many other people is that our availability is like that of the young man on the grass. We are sitting out there waiting to be called. And this is the life that some people think that we lead. The young lady at the computer, on the other hand, is a little closer to reality. Friends and family and neighbors may not always understand that freelance does not mean free time. But the truth is it does often mean flexible time and a portable workspace. These factors often make us a natural choice to be primary caregivers. And while it may cost us a few jobs along the way, it doesn't have to cost us our business. We can choose when, where, and how much to work. But if our business is to survive, we must honor deadlines, foster relationships with clients, consider business hours and time zones for our clients, have reliable functioning work tools, have reliable communications technology, have access to banking services, devote time to administrative work, and find time for self-care. So how do we add caregiving and still juggle it all? Well, let's look at the short term. This is less than three months. Somebody has an illness that is longer than a few days, but shorter than three months and you need to care for them. You're going to have to adjust your work schedule to take into account doctor's appointments, things like that. You need to build a network of trusted colleagues who can partner with you during this time. Make sure it's somebody whose quality is reliable and make sure to pay them on time so that you remain a trusted colleague with them. Reduce your workload if necessary to make sure that you don't miss deadlines. Let your clients know that you'll be less available but are still working. They don't need a lot of detail, but they do need to know that you are aware of their needs and respect their time. So answer their messages. Either accept, reroute, or reject work promptly. Update your clients as soon as the situation changes and you are once again fully available. In the mid to long term, predictable care, for instance, when you're caring for somebody with a chronic or a long-term but temporary condition, uh, raising children, although as they get older, they become more independent, uh, caring for someone who's elderly or disabled but is otherwise in good health so that you can do the services that they need and still have a basically dependable amount of time at your computer. There, what you're going to need to do is make sure you stick to a realistic work schedule and workload. As mentioned before, your business can absorb better you turning down a job than you accepting it and doing it poorly. Partner with colleagues who can help you when something unexpected comes up. Have a dedicated workspace in your home if you're caring for the person at your home. When my children were young, my living room corner was my office. And so when they would get back from school, I would wear a headset. That headset told them mom's working. They didn't know that it wasn't usually plugged in. 
almost never, but it served as a visual that I was working, even though my workspace was part of the rest of the house. Have that work dedicated workspace. And another way to show people that you're working is wear business attire. That way, your loved ones will remember that, yes, right now you are working, but you're still available there for their care. And when you're not actively working, be actively present in the rest of your life. So what about those journeys through the unpredictable, like Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia or terminal illnesses? Welcome to uncertainty. Caring for someone with any form of dementia or in the final stages of a terminal illness is an exercise in unpredictability. The only thing you know for certain is that your loved one will not get better. Please sit with that for a moment and think about it. There is no euphemism that makes this any easier. Accepting that reality is the first step toward crafting a plan to help you balance being a caregiver while your business stays afloat. And with all due respect to Will Shakespeare, while the play may be the thing for Hamlet, the plan is the thing for you. The plan is what will preserve your sanity and your business. Whether you're facing that challenge in the future or are juggling those roles right now, you need a plan. So now it's time for your worksheet. Please take that out, either print it out, put it up on a second screen, and be prepared to make just a few notes as we go along. These are the initial thoughts that come to mind. Later, you can go back to it, fill it out with more complete information or more thought. So pause the video, go get your worksheet, and then start up again once you're ready. All right, crafting the plan. Section one is your loved one's care, and this is what the worksheet addresses. You need to know what your loved one's wishes are. So what are they? Have they ever expressed to you what they would prefer to have happen if they lost their capacity to make decisions for themselves? What phase are you in right now? Pre-care, imminent, already in the deep end? Identify all primary caregivers, then classify them as primary, secondary, or tertiary. The primary caregivers are the ones who are part an, an active part of your plan. They spend regular times with your loved one. They have regular assumed duties with your loved one. Secondary are the ones who can step in when you need. If somebody isn't available to take someone shopping, your loved one shopping, if they're capable of going shopping, um, if somebody needs to come and sit with them for the afternoon, these are your secondary. Your tertiary are the people who can't actually commit to any kind of regular participation, but who are happy to do things like run errands, pick up a few groceries for your loved one while they're out doing their own shopping, things like that. The next thing on the agenda is to identify your loved one's needs. Now, if you're looking at this down the road a while, you may not know those yet. But what you're gonna to wanna to take into account is things like nursing assistance, memory care, meal preparation, transportation to doctors, quality of life activities like going out to the park or to the library. Identify their needs. What are they going to need during this time? And then what resources are there available? In the area where you live or where they live, do they offer at-home respite services? Can you arrange home health care visits? What about daycare services? Is there any government program that might help you with assistive devices such as handrails? And then finally, you're going to have to think about money, which is never a fun thing to do in this context. But you need to consider what the financial outlook is, whether there are private savings, public programs that could help, medical insurance, long-term care insurance, 
Are medications covered by an insurance plan? Are fees negotiable? Who can contribute to these out-of-pocket expenses? Once you have all of this information, it should be written down and distributed among all of the primary caregivers. Now we move on to crafting the plan, and this is about your business. The pieces of the puzzle are first redundancy and backups. If something goes wrong, you may not have time to fix it until later, sometimes much later. So have more than one way to connect to the internet. I used a USB satellite card, but you may have other options. Have more than one place to store your work. An offsite backup system like iDrive or, or Carbonite, that's, those are great. But if your computer goes down and you have to finish a job and the only computer available is your parents' old laptop, you need something more portable. So back your work up periodically, the work that, you're, that you have in process, back it up periodically to a flash drive or to a Dropbox or something like that. You also want to have more than one way to access your research tools. This is for if you are not working at home where you have your own tools available. Dictionaries and glossaries stored on your hard drive or flash drive are great. Smartphone apps and browsers can help. Don't limit yourself to just one option. And then have multiple caregivers at each of those levels. You were counting on having two hours to finish that job because Aunt Judy was going to come and visit your parents, but then she canceled. Have Cousin Fred on speed dial. Have that next door neighbor on speed dial with their permission, of course, so that you have someone to turn to during those moments. Caregivers also need to be redundant. And finally, adapting. We have, this is an exercise not just in unpredictability, but in realism. Whatever time it would normally take you to do a job, allow yourself at least half again as much. You will be interrupted. The one constant when caring for someone with dementia or a terminal illness is that they can't wait for you to get around to their needs. So build in a margin of time in case you need to drop everything and run out to keep them from wandering off, or you need to dress a cut, or you need to make a snack, make one for yourself as well. Build your work schedule around your loved one's needs. At this point, the rhythm of their lives is what governs yours. When and how long do they take naps? Do they have favorite TV shows that will keep them entertained? These things change over time, so your schedule will also change. At one point, I was working from 10 p.m. to about 3 or 4 in the morning because that's what worked at that time. You may have to step back from certain kinds of jobs. As I mentioned, I'm also a licensed court interpreter. Obviously, court interpreting was not an option while I was caring for my parents. So during that time, I took on more translation work. I took on some transcription work. There are other ways that you can fill in that income if you have the time to do it. But be realistic about what jobs you can and cannot do during your caregiving time. Hydrate and watch your nutrition. It is so easy to overlook our own body's needs, like sleep, when we're juggling the caregiving and work. And if you're working from your loved one's home and don't have your two monitor set up or something else in your workspace that you rely on, see what you can do to replicate it. Use a tablet along with your laptop, or if there's storage space, buy a cheap monitor and keep it there to use with your laptop when you're there. Another piece of the puzzle is communication with your clients, with your colleagues, and with other caregivers. Notify your clients that for personal reasons, you'll need to adjust your work availability. And again, only include details according to your relationship with that particular client. Keep it professional. Let them know that you will check messages X number of times a day and then do it. A lack of communication will hurt your business more than a lack of availability. Communicate with trusted colleagues, communicate with other caregivers, 
They need to know if something changes. Communicate with your support network. Family members who aren't in your caregiver's group, friends, spiritual advisors, somebody that you can turn to to vent to when the pressure builds. You've got to have somebody who can help anchor you on the outside of all of this. And then finally, the last piece of the puzzle is you. Wonderful you. Take time to step away and breathe. Even if it's just for five minutes at a time, listen to a song, step outside to the back porch, breathe some fresh air, browse your friend's latest grandkid or pet pictures on Facebook, go for a walk while somebody else sits with your loved one, do something to step outside of the constant demand on your time. Laugh. There is humor all around us. Look for it. Toward the end of his life, my father, who had pancreatic cancer, as well as Alzheimer's, he was in a hospital bed in the living room. And once before putting him in a sitting position, I said, may I raise you, daddy? And he just automatically responded, well, sure, I raised you. And that just cracked me up at the moment. He laughed, I laughed, and it was such a stress relief. Find the humor. And now you've got it, your plan, parts one and two. It's done. You've considered every angle. You've looked at redundancies and resources and needs. Now put the plan aside. This plan will change many, many times over the years. By the time you're done, it won't look anything like this nice, crisp, clean roadmap that you've just drafted. And that's okay. The plan, like everything else, must be flexible. But now, with filling out your little worksheet and putting some thought into this, you will have a framework. You will have a starting place and you will have a direction. The rest will be unique to you, your team, your resources, and most of all, your loved one's specific circumstances. One last note, and this is a personal piece of advice. My mother was a pianist, and she had these wonderful long slim fingers that could just dance over the keyboard, but over the years, rheumatoid arthritis twisted her fingers. She could barely hit the keys on a computer keyboard. But even after the dementia started, and she forgot why her fingers didn't work, if I sat next to her on a piano bench and put her at the let her put her fingers on the keys, something wonderful would happen. She would start to play. And this amazing music would come pouring out of those warped fingers. And it was such a moment of peace and connection for the two of us. So when your loved one is lucid and wants to connect, if you possibly can, drop everything and just be in the moment with them. Listen to them, sing with them, read with them. Plenty of other people can give them physical care, but you can give them those personal moments, those connections that they need. Caring for your loved one while balancing business can be a challenge, but it can also be a singular gift. Resources, I've offered you here a couple of resources that you can check. Remember that when caring for your loved one with dementia, safety is paramount. There are times when a memory care facility with 24-7 monitoring is the only realistic option. And if that happens to be the case for you, then that is the most loving decision you can make. You need to keep your loved one safe. So do what you need to do for that. And don't feel pressured by anybody else. You're the one who knows the situation. So thank you. I wish you all the best now and in the future. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit.